Welcome to Life Blood. This is George G, and the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful David Kakish. David, are you ready to do this? Let's do it, George. Let's, good morning. Let's, let's go. Good morning. David is the founder and president of RIA Workspace. He is an author, an entrepreneur, and a secure IT advocate. Excited to have you on, David. Tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and why you do what you do. Well, good morning, uh, George. I want to welcome you, and I want to welcome the listener. My name is David Kakish. I am the uh, uh, founder uh, of a company called RIA Workspace. We provide specialized IT, cloud, and cybersecurity services for financial advisors and small and mid-sized businesses. Um, uh, you know, as a listener, you either are part of a business or you run a business. So a lot of the things that I talk about will apply, whether or not you're a business owner. Uh, you know, from a personal perspective, I live uh, I live in Chicago. Um, I love traveling. Um, something that not a lot of people know about myself is. I, I grew up in an orphanage overseas, but I was not an orphan. I had two loving parents. Um, uh, my parents directed an orphanage. So I was that kid that grew up on the other side of the tracks, not because I came from a broken home, but because my parents were involved in nonprofits. So I've got a pretty interesting, pers a very different perspective of the world, I guess. Uh, um, so on a personal note. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt about that. There's probably a whole podcast about that. That's like the start of one of those jokes of uh, I grew up in an orphanage overseas, but but I have two loving parents kind of a thing. And people are like, what? How does that even work? So, <laughs> so how, 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 how did you get into entrepreneurship? Yeah, you know what? So it, my my whole I, I worked in corporate America for a while. And, you know, like many people, I, I'm grateful. It, it was great. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I distinctly remember the day I walk into the bathroom, I go and I wash my face and I look at myself and I'm saying, what the heck am I still doing here? Right. I was doing well, making money, but it was, you know, I wanted more um, in my entrepreneurial life. So you get that entrepreneurial itch. You want to go out, you want to start your business. And I mean, I distinctly remember the day I'm like, what in the world am I doing here? You know, I, I need to, I need to move on. And I think we all have those moments, but to kind of tie this back up with my background, I'm really, really, really passionate about what I call the small guy. And what I mean by that is that small to mid-sized business or that business entrepreneur. Not a really big fan of working in corporate America or big companies, but I really, really, really love working with businesses that are 5, 10, 15, 25 employees. Again, when we work with businesses significantly bigger and businesses smaller, but that's really where my real passion is. And the financial advisors, the registered investment advisors, many of them are, you know, 5, 15, 25 employees. And so for me, that small business owner, that small business entrepreneur, is the small giant. Um, and I love working with small giants. And that's sort of my philosophy in life was, and, and I found real freedom with sort of the three pillars, entrepreneurship, technology, and innovation. So I took those things, I embarked upon that, and I have a team, but those are kind of like three pillars that it doesn't matter how old you are, the color of your skin, your religion, male, female, skinny, not skinny, you know, and, and so those are kind of pillars for me in life. And it's wonderful to be able to apply that. And I found total freedom in that. Um, and in the businesses we work with, and I love working with those kind of businesses. So I'm not even talking specifically about my business, I'm kind of getting philosophical. But these are things that I love to share with the listener. Um, because that's to me, that's what real freedom is really all about. Yeah, amen. I appreciate all that. So the the jump from working in corporate America, scratching that entrepreneurial itch, which is, I think, a jump that a lot of people make, and they want to do things right. They want to make sure that they're that they're checking all the important boxes. How how do you think about? Well, maybe just talk about checklists, standard operating procedures, because I'm I, I think that that is such a key thing that is overlooked a lot of the time. That is a great question. And the funny part is I'm not really great at that. Mm. And, and however, however, I am a big believer in the power of a team. And what happens is from day one, I did not start my entrepreneurial venture on my own. I always believed in having the power of a team. So from the first day, we had a team that was in place. And so philosophically, um, you know, the formula that I talk about is most people think one plus one plus one equals three. 
And I go, no, if there's three of us and we can accomplish a lot more, it's, it's three to the power of three. So it's three times three times three, which equals 27. So if you're able to, to, to leverage the team the right way, you can accomplish a lot more. So the answer to your question is, of course, I'm a big fan of the checklists. And um, I've got somebody on my team that that is his specialty. So a, the equivalent of what I would call a COO, right? A chief operating officer. And without him, um, you know, the trains don't run on time and many things. So a lot of times the visionary is not the best person for these checklists, um, but I've got somebody on my team that does that, and it's fantastic. And that's that that's that's really one of the the issues that so many entrepreneurs run into is that they are the visionary. They are pushing the thing forward, and that's what they want to do. And so I'm sure that you're perfectly comfortable with the reality that the work that you're doing is oftentimes not the stuff that the entrepreneur wants to focus on, not the stuff that the person heading the RIA is interested in talking about or putting any effort towards at all. Correct. Correct. So the way, the way I think of this and the way we look at that internally is we call that a tripod, right? So there's three of us. So a, a visionary, a COO, and then a CTO, right? And that, that's kind of, you know, the, the three, um, three things that you need for the stool and any of those that are missing, you know, that stool is going to fall off. And obviously in other businesses that might look a little bit different and things like that. But in, in, in our business, that's what we do. And, and, you know, I don't want to get too far off message, but one of the big things that, that I talk a lot about, and again, this applies to you as an individual or as a business is the cybersecurity risks that are out there, right? So if you're a high net worth individual, um, there are things that simple things that you can do to maximize your security. If you're a small business, there's some simple things that you can do to really maximize your security. And the big thing that we're seeing a lot with financial advisors is because they have a lot of money um, assets under management. Um, they're an easy target sometimes because, you know, again, they might be three, five, 10 people. Um, somebody halfway across the world really, really, really wants that information, really wants to be able to get into that. And the big challenge is, again, you're a small, you're a mid-sized business, but what you need is big business type of security and big business type of IT. How do you get that without breaking the bank, right? And so that's kind of the big challenge. And again, that's a ch the cybersecurity challenge for the RIA, the cybersecurity challenge for the small business, the cybersecurity challenge for the individual, you know, how do, how do you maximize security? And, and those are, you know, those are the things that we're kind of evangelizing about within a very specific niche market, which is the RIAs or the financial advisors, but that's really applicable across, you know, any, any smaller mid-sized business that's out there. Yeah. So are there certain things you talked about simple things you can do to improve security? What, what are the things that you see most often overlooked? Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised at some of the simple things that are that really, really, really maximize security that are overlooked, <laughs> like, like what you just said right now. Um, two things that are top of mind for me is uh, the, you know, the concept of multi-factor authentication, right? A, a lot of us know about that, but we may not have that enabled. Um, I would say, you know, before the end of the business day to day, go into your email and make sure you've got all the multi-factor authentication enabled. If, if you're a business, make sure that your business accounts are multi-factor authentication enabled. I mean, that's the least expensive way to maximize security of your email, to maximize security of accessing a web-based software. Um, and let me give you a specific example, George, that I want to share with the listener. You, you probably have access to a web-based software, right? And it's got some confidential information in there. And you're using a, a, you've got a username and you've got a password, right? Your email and a password. Sure. And you're probably using the same password across many different places, right? That's pretty common. Um, <laughs> if, if, and I'm not talking specifically to you, George, I'm talking sure. to the listener. So. <laughs> so, so the big challenge is if somebody halfway across the world um, got that, or even, you know, down the street, they don't have to be halfway across the world. They can be down the street from you or across town, right? All of a sudden now they're able to go in and access that information. Um, and you know, how would you feel about that? If they had access to that, the, the, again, the least Bad. expensive way to do that exactly <laughs> is, is just to enable the multi-factor authentication, right? That's a big one that I see. And it's like, just, just, 
be, you know, before you go to bed today, go and enable it. And, and that's the least expensive way to maximize your security. So that's one big one that I see. Um, the second one that is really, really, really big. And again, it's kind of like exercise. We know how important it is and we should be doing it, but we're not doing it is security awareness training for your employees, right? So if you're a business owner um, or if you work in a business and you're doing some kind of security awareness training, fantastic. That's exactly what you want to do. If you don't, you want to have that in place because many times that's the weakest link, right? That's one of the weakest links that are out there, you know, because everybody thinks it's a firewall and this and that, and really it's your employees, it's your people that a lot of times are your weakest links. So you want to have them trained uh, properly to do that. Now, if you're a business, and especially if you're a financial advisor, we created a, a cybersecurity checklist. We've got a 29-point cybersecurity checklist. Um, you can go to www.riaworkspace.com forward slash podcast, and we have those 29 checklist items listed right there. It's free. You can download the PDF. You don't have to put your email or anything like that. Take that give it to your chief compliance officer, give it to your IT person. Hey, say, hey, do we have that covered? It's fantastic. So that's one tool that I encourage people to do and use. The other tool um, is if you're using the Microsoft platform, Microsoft has a fantastic tool for you. You just go to security.microsoft.com uh, without the www. So you go to security.microsoft.com. And if you've got administrative access to the Microsoft portal, it's going to give you a score right then and there. And again, you can give that to your IT person and say, our score is X. Why don't you help us to go ahead and improve that? So these are kind of free tools that we that are out there um, uh, that, again, if you run a business, if you're a financial advisor, or if you're an employee, you can go ahead and you can leverage that and, and you can give it to the uh, uh, whoever is responsible for IT at your company. And if it's just a solo shop or a handful of people, how do they know, okay, it's time for me to stop DIYing this? Yeah, that is a, that, that, that's a great question. Um, for, let me talk about the financial advisor niche specifically. A lot of times their brokers already have things in place to maximize the security. So, you know, if you're part of whoever, and I'm not going to name doing a lot of that type of stuff. Um, in other businesses, the parent company or the franchisor is usually handling a lot of that. The real challenge is for the truly independent one, two, three, four person type of company, go use that checklist, give it to the IT person, say, hey, are we protected here? I Because I don't want to get in too much into the the mechanics of it, because my goal isn't to overwhelm the listener, but man, go get that checklist, give it to the IT person, give it to, you know, whoever is responsible and say, hey, do we have these things covered? That's probably the easiest way for that person to accomplish that. And so if the answer is no, we, <laughs> we don't, that might be the indication that it's time to start or it's out to, to start partnering with a firm like yours. <laughs> I like it. Fork with, with businesses with typically, you know, five or more employees. That's where our, our, uh, uh, our model begins to make a lot of sense. But even if you're less than that, I think, I think the key, George, is you, the, the, the business, you know, the small business, you don't want to be a sitting duck. I mean, there's a psychology or there's a mindset that, hey, we're too small. You know, they're really not interested in us. You would be really, really, really surprised. They're interested in you because you might be the weakest link, right? So you've got these attackers that are basically doing some quick scans out there and saying, hey, what's open and what's not? And if you at least have like a baseline level of security, they're going to overlook you. You just don't want to be that easy target. You don't want to be that sitting duck. And so there's some baseline level things that you can do. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I could I could get into a lot of detail, but I don't want to overwhelm the listener because the idea isn't to get a little bit too technical but you know the other the other piece that maybe i would talk about is a lot of people are working uh in coffee shops a lot of people are working in hotels and traveling and from home and things like that so something you really want to think about that's different now than it was even just two years ago sort of that traditional network where people went into an office, they worked on a computer behind a network firewall, right? And, and basically you were protected because you had a network firewall and you had antivirus and that's great. But 
you know, with the pandemic and with the way the world is today, that's that's not the norm anymore, right? Everybody's working remote. So you want to think about this concept called endpoint security, which is, hey, if it's your iPhone, if it's your iPad, if it's your laptop, right? You want to have a security wrap around that computer and think of it as kind of like that next generation antivirus, next generation firewall that that is wrapped around that laptop of yours. And, you know, maybe an analogy is, Kind of like the bubble boy, take your laptop and imagine that there's a bubble wrapped around that. So there's this concept called endpoint security. I, I would talk to your IT provider about that just to maximize the, the security of that computer when you're on the road or when you're at home. Is a VPN something somebody should have? Yes, I strongly encourage that. Again, what we do with our clients, we have that what we call the next generation VPN so that that's already built in so that computer before it can connect and 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 work and do the things that you need to do we have to make sure it meet it meets compliance like hey is there is there an antivirus installed on that is there an anti spyware is encryption enabled you know all these things and if it is fantastic you can go ahead and you can connect if you don't have that or you don't know what that is by all means, yeah, you want to have some kind of a VPN because you're working in a Starbucks and, you know, you want to be really careful with what you're doing um, if you don't have that VPN. Got it. Yeah. Well, David, the people are ready for your difference making tip, even though you've given us a lot. <laughs> what do you have for them? <laughs> Listen, if I want to leave the listener with one concept and there's one thing that you can do, I just want to repeat. It's like, go back, look at your email account, look at your Microsoft account, your Google account, whatever it is and go and make sure you've got multi-factor authentication enabled. It's, it's the least expensive way and probably the easiest way to maximize the security of your email and your systems. Um, again, many of us know that that's already out there, but are we doing it or are we not? That would be my, that would be my one tip that I would leave the listener. Well, I think that is great stuff that definitely gets to come up. Got to make sure that we are mastering the uh, fundamentals and the basics. David. And so I bet you know, how, 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 how many folks out there, like half don't have that on three quarters, 90%. I, I, I don't know what that number is, but um, uh, too many. I, 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 yeah, yeah, too many. Exactly. I, I'd have to go back and, and see what it is, but it's actually amazing. And I don't want to get too philosophical on people on this, but if you go and you actually look this up on Microsoft right now, they're basically saying, Hey, multi-factor authentication is a lot more important than a complex password or even changing your password. And, and so, you know, the, you, you can go and you can Google this and look this up, but the, the, uh, the, 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 there's way too many people. And I agree with you. Hey, you're a listener. Just go and do this. It doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything. This is already included. So this is, a, this is a free tip for the listener. You know, go in and do that. It does not cost you anything. This is something that's already provided by... Um, you know, by the tech companies that are out there. We're just not taking advantage of that. Got it. David, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? How can they engage with RIA Workspace? Absolutely. So the checklist is available at www.riaworkspace.com forward slash podcast. So everything I talked about is, is mentioned there. Um, you can get those checklists. And again, you don't need to put in an email. If you want to get in touch with me, just go to riaworkspace.com click the contact us button and then my team will get you and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put you in touch with me. Love it. Well, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, show David your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas, pick up a copy of that checklist at riaworkspace.com forward slash podcast and check out the great resources and make sure that you've got your multi-factor authentication activated for goodness sakes. Thanks again, David. Thanks, George. And until next time, keep fighting the good fight. We are all in this together.